Testing, one, two, three. Oh. Was the sound fixed on the uh, video device? Remember the last few weeks? Okay. Can you tell if it's working? Excuse me? Oh. Whenever I speak, you get the static, or the static is Continuous. Excuse me? I'm asking the audience on the The audience. So they'll type in whether they can hear clearly or not? Can you hear my voice clearly? Full of what? Echoes. Echoes. Really so how can you test it? I'm with the audience. I can with my yeah, but you need a voice speaking. I have to be speaking, right? Yes. If I just keep silent, then they can't tell. Should I read something to <laughs> Okay, you want to see if it's better. Okay, thus have I heard long glasses. On one occasion the blessed one was wandering among the coastlands together with a large Sangha of bhikkhus. Then the Blessed One left the main road, and at a certain place he smiled. <coughs> Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was wandering among the Kosalans, together with a large Sangha of bhikkhus. Then the Blessed One left the main road, and at a certain place he smiled. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Tuangyan Monastery <laughs> in Taishu Hall <laughs> on the shrine of, <laughs> of Bhante's room. <laughs> okay, so let us start then. Okay, I'm going to start, whether they can get it or not, we have to start. Okay, so we start with the homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato 
Samasambuddhas Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samasambuddhas Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samasambuddhas Okay, good morning, everybody. Okay, the last time we were discussing a sutta which was very heavy in matters of doctrine and dealing with the details of Buddhist practice and dealing with very high stages of practice. Now we come to a sutta, actually it will be like, like a series of suttas, which focus on stories, and some of them have almost a legendary type of quality. And so, when we come to these suttas, it won't be so much me giving a lecture and just asking questions, but maybe we will explore some of these stories together and see what kind of significance we can draw out from them. Because I always believe that even though a story seems to be largely legendary, but there always seems to be some kind of message or instructions coming through the framework of the story. Okay, so this is the story. First, the sutta is number 81 in the Majjhima it's called the Gatikara Sutta, and it's about a person named Gatikara the potter. Actually, the word Gatikara itself means pot maker, so it seems to be more of a designation than a proper name based on his occupation. Okay, so the sutta begins when the Buddha has been wandering among the Kosalans together with a large community of monks. Okay, and then it's said that the Buddha left the main road and probably went off a little bit on the side road and at a certain place he smiled. And so, when the Buddha smiles like this, it seems to be inviting a question from his disciples. So when Ananda saw the Buddha smile, then it occurred to the Venerable Ananda, he thought, what is the reason for the Blessed One to smile? And then this is interesting, he says, Tathagatas do not smile for no reason. Why do I say that this sentence seems interesting and a little bit intriguing? That's not what I'm thinking of. Um, I'd say that's too technical. <laughs> Read the sentence again. Okay, first it says, what is the reason, what is the cause for the Blessed One's smile? To targeters do not smile for no reason. <laughs> Actually, that's a good, good question, <laughs> but it wasn't what I had in mind. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's phrasing this point in a plural form, as though Ananda somehow knows what all of the Buddhas do and don't do. And it seems a little bit puzzling. How does Ananda know this? I mean, I don't know. 
Could it be the Buddha told him? Or maybe Ananda is just drawing an inference? But anyway, you know, I don't have a definite answer unless one of you do, if you do, speak up. But it just seems to me somewhat intriguing, a little, even a little puzzling, that suddenly the text shifts from a singular, the blessed one, the Buddha Gotama, who is standing right next to me, to a generalization about what all of the Buddhas do. Of course, Ananda might know this from the point that Barbara made, <laughs> that <laughs> nobody smiles without a reason. So, But probably, maybe the point that Ananda's uh, statement is trying to convey is that the Buddha wants to convey some point, so he's smiling in this way, you know, not just through purely natural, uh, just as a spontaneous reaction to some situation, but because he wants to provoke in us a question to ask about the smile. Okay, so then, when Ananda thinks in this way, then he politely puts his hands in the Anjali position, and he asks the Buddha, again, this, he, he just expresses his thoughts, again moving from the singular to the plural. Okay, so then the Buddha, now he's going to begin the story, or at least he's going to introduce the subject of the story. Okay, so the Buddha says, once Ananda, in this place, it's probably now a deserted field, or open field, but the Buddha says, in this very place there was a prosperous and market town called Vebalinga, with many inhabitants and crowded with people. And now the Blessed One, it's the Buddha, Kasapa, who is accomplished, that's Arahat, and fully enlightened, the Samasambuddha, lived near the market town Vebalinga, and it was here that the Blessed One, Kasapa, had his monastery, and it was right here that he sat and advised the Sangha of Bhikkhus. So right in this very spot, this Buddha Kasapa had a monastery, and it was right in this spot that he used to sit when he would give discourses to the monks. Okay, who is the Blessed One Kasapa? the Buddha Kasapa. Anybody know? Excuse me? Exactly. Yeah, he was the Buddha immediately preceding Gautama Buddha. According to the early Buddha's texts, well, let's say the early Buddha's texts mentioned seven Buddha, or six According to the early Buddhist text, Gotama Buddha is the. S Let me put it this way. The early Buddhist text mentioned five Buddhas who preceded Kasap, uh, who preceded Gotama Buddha. So the f five who preceded Gotama, we go back. I think it's ninety-one cosmic cycles. It's the Buddha named Vipassi. Then he was followed by the Buddha named Siki. And those two belong to another world cycle, not the present world cycle. Then in this present world cycle, we have the Buddha Kakusanda, Kona, Kona Gamana, Kasapa, and then Gotama. Okay, this is the traditional Buddhist belief, but it's not just a belief that appeared to arise in later times, but it's actually 
mentioned, this sequence or succession of Buddhas is mentioned several times in the suttas, in different nikayas. And now this is a curious point that maybe some of you could help me out with. <laughs> okay, we have, through the work of historians, archaeologists, paleontologists, geologists, a pretty, I mean, this is quite astonishing. We have a very accurate idea of the past history of humanity from the very time when beings who seemed a little different from other types of apes got up on their hind legs and started moving about and you know through the fossil record we could trace the evolution of these beings you know the growth of the skull size to to accommodate a increasing size of the brain we can trace the the migration of the primeval human beings originally starting someplace in east africa and spreading out across the globe so maybe there was a separate line that began in some place in China. I'm not sure what the latest findings are. And then we have um, records of you know the lifestyle of primitive man during the stage of the hunter-gatherer, the beginnings of agriculture, development from primitive pri from a very primitive stage of agriculture through early civilizations up to Indian civilization in the time of the Buddha. And then we have pretty accurate historical records from the time of the Buddha up to the present. Of course, there might be some gaps here and there, but pretty much we can conjecture or speculate what took place within those gaps. But we don't have any record, nothing to indicate that in order for a Buddha to have arisen before Gautama, there would have had to be a fully developed Indian civilization. And not only that, but the Buddha's texts tell us the lifespans of these past Buddhas. And I think it's said that the lifespan of Kasapa was 20,000 years, something like that. I don't remember the exact figure but it was much, much longer than <laughs> the lifespan of human beings today. I think the way it goes is that in Kakosandas, when the Buddha Kakosanda had arisen in this very planet, the lifespan was 80,000 years, then it went out, or maybe it was 60,000 years, then Kona Gamana, it went down to 40,000 years, in the time of Kasapa Buddha, it was 20,000 years. And then we come to Gotama Buddha. This is a way of kind of <laughs> showing how humanity has degenerated <laughs> over time. It said that the lifespan of the healthiest human being is 120 years. But most human beings will, you know, will live 80 years or about 80 years. You know, so we don't have any trace of a highly developed Buddha civilization in the archaeological records. You know, we should find, you know, beneath the archaeological finds coming from the Vedic period, there should be, then be traces of a Buddha civilization beneath that but there's no, no traces like that. And there would have to be some kind of fossils to indicate, or at least artifacts to indicate that human beings had extremely long lifespans. So how do we make sense out of that? Please, please feel free to say anything you Yeah. 
Ja. Ja. Good what? Oh, that's no problem. Yeah. That makes sense in itself, but I don't see how it addresses this particular problem. That how do we account for the lack of any kind of archaeological evidence for a fully developed Buddhist civilization <laughs> on this planet? Yeah, that is mentioned in the text. Yeah. Um, you know, that seems a bit speculative to me. <laughs> because... He, okay. Yeah. Yeah. First, I don't think it would mean that every th that everything that exists. But this is getting a little off track. But <laughs> it doesn't mean that everything that exists now has existed over and over again in the past. That would be more like was Nietzsche's theory of the eternal recurrence. And it doesn't mean that everything that's possible has already existed. I don't see that as... Yeah. Because the sutta is saying, in this exact spot, so, I mean, it's certainly conceivable, the universe, this world system, is expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting, and each time it goes through the stage of expansion and development, then it's quite possible that beings, at least on some planets, beings like humans will arise, and amongst the humans, Buddhas will arise. So the idea of you know past Buddhas, or even Buddhas presently existing now on other worlds, in other world systems, is quite I mean, not problematic at all, in my view. But what seems to be problematic is saying that in this spot, that's on this earth, right there in India, another Buddha existed who had his monastery and taught the monks. David, did you have some? Take the, the microphone so that um, the sound gets amplified. It's on, it's on. Yeah. 
Ja, ja, ja. Yeah, I would be inclined not to take it so literally. But I was just thinking maybe somebody else had some suggestion to <laughs> sort of defend the literalist interpretation. Did Barbara, you want to say something? Take the microphone. Yeah, that's actually true, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kushinaka, yeah, yeah. Also mention that <laughs> at present there is, I think it's in Nepal, a stupa which is said to hold the relics of the Buddha Kasapa after his cremation. You know, the relics were placed there. I've never been to to see that stupa, and I don't know whether anybody has ever l looked inside. Anybody who's alive now has looked inside to confirm whether relics are there then we would have to raise the question, are these really relics? Or somebody could put, you know, just ordinary bones there and say those are the remains of a Buddha. Anyway, there are various problems about this idea. I don't know a solution. Okay, let us continue. And we don't have to take it so literally. That's maybe the simplest solution. But take it as sort of a story that's conveying a teaching lesson. Okay, so when the Buddha mentions this fact, then Venerable Ananda takes his, his outer robe, he folds it in four, and he asks the Buddha to sit on that spot. And so then he, could, he says that, in that, if you do so, then this place will have been used by two Buddhas. <laughs> okay, so... The Buddha then sits down on the seat, and then he's going to now relate the story. So he says that in this, uh, he repeats what he said earlier, that in this place there was this prosperous town called Vebalinka, where the Buddha Kasapa had his monastery. Okay, and now we come to the main part of the story, that in the town of Vebalinka, the Buddha Kasapa had a supporter as his chief supporter, a potter named Gatikara. And as I mentioned earlier, the word Gatikara is actually from Kara, which means maker, and Gatta means a pot. So Gatikara means a maker of pots. And Gatikara, the potter, had as a friend, his close friend, a Brahmin student named Jyotipala. There seems to be some things of significance coming through here. I don't see our Richard Duffy. Is he here today? Usually he would catch the significance of this. But there seems to be something being conveyed, even very subtly, a message here. Can anybody say, see what it is? To get the message, you would have to know something about Indian society. We don't have any people of Indian descent. 
Exactly, exactly. And the pot maker would be considered, I mean, it's like a working class, and the Brahmin is like, you know, the religious elite. And not only that, not only that there's a friendship between Gatikara the potter from a low caste family a lo and the Brahmin student, the young Brahmin named Jyotipala. But if somebody knows anything about Indian society or Indian names, they would know that the name Kasapa or in Sanskrit Kashyapa is a Brahmin name. And so the Buddha, who is in this case from the, not Gautama Buddha, who is from the Kshatriya clan, but the Buddha Kasapa, who's originally from the Brahmin clan, he has as his chief supporter, not somebody like our Buddha has as his chief supporter, and not the Pindika, who's the equivalent of a banking executive, you know, a wealthy financier. But he has his chief supporter is this, you know, little dinky guy who's making pots for a living. It's as if maybe, I don't know if the comparison is fully respectful to the Buddha, but it's as if you were to go into, say, a, what do they call this, a Starbucks, and you were to see, was this, the chairman of Chase, of J.P. Morgan Chase, Jamie, Janie Diamond, sitting and having a cup of coffee with a, a taxi driver. And then you walk over and say, aren't you Jamie Diamond? He says, oh yes, yes, and I want you to meet my best friend, Joe the taxi driver, or Joe the plumber. Not, no, not, not, not that, not that, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not, not that Joe the plumber. <laughs> Maybe that got stuck, a, a mem stuck in my mind. <laughs> uh, Harry the plumber. <laughs> okay, so now one day Gatikara asks his friend Jyotipala, and then the important thing about Jyotipala that will be mentioned at the end of the sutta. Anybody know what that important fact about Jyotipala is? Exactly. Jyotipala is a past life, it was a past life incarnation of the being who is to become Gautama Buddha or Shakyamuni Buddha. And so this story is actually somewhat like a Jataka story. The word Jataka means referring to previous births. So this is the story of a past birth of Shakyamuni Buddha, referring to a time when he was a, Bra a young Brahmin. Okay, so one day the potter Gatikara addresses his friend Jyotipala and he says, my dear Jyotipala, let us go and see the Buddha Kasapa. It's good to see these, the Blessed One who's an Arahant and the perfectly enlightened one. And then the Brahman Jyotipala, who's going to become Gotama Buddha, says, I don't know if it comes through so well in English, when he says, enough, it's like alang. It's like, you know, get out of, you know, what are you saying? A crazy idea. What's the use of see, seeing that bald pated recluse? It uses the mundaka samadaka, that baldy head. You know, it's a really derogatory term. And this was the kind of terms that the Brahmins in the Buddha's time would use, or at least some of them, those who are 
rather um, arrogant and puffed up with pride about their class status. That was the term that the Brahmins would use for the summoners, for the ascetics, even when they would sometimes they would denigrate the Buddha, the Buddha Gotama, by calling him a bald-headed ascetic, baldy head. Okay, so a second time, a third time, Gatikara tries to persuade his friend Jyotipala to go see the Buddha, and each time Jyotipala dismisses it with the same kind of derogatory remark. Okay, so then um, Gatikara, finally, he gives up, and he says to Jyotipala, let's take a lufa, it's a kind of bathing device, and some bath powder, and go to the river to bathe. And so they, they go to the river, they go into the river, and then I think Gatikara had a sort of plot or a scheme in his mind when he took Jyotipala to the river. Okay, so he asks him again, let's go see the Buddha. Again, Jyotipala sort of dismisses the suggestion. A second time, a third time, he says that. And then now in paragraph eight, then the potter Gatikara sees the Brahmin student Jyotipala by the belt and said, let's go see the Buddha whose enlightened monastery is quite nearby. Again, Jyotipala dismisses the suggestion. And now paragraph nine, then when the Brahmin student Jyotipala had washed his head, the potter Gatikara seized him by the hair. You know, like in India, they would, the men would grow the hair long and the Brahmins would have really long hair, like <laughs> I was going to say, like <laughs> I think you're the only one who has <laughs> yeah, you're the only one who has really long hair. <laughs> All of you women have, even these two who are visiting, have much shorter hair than a Brahmin in India in the Buddhist time would have had. They would have the long hair, which they would wind up and then turn into a kind of, wind up into a kind of, what do they call this on the top of the head? Like a coil on the top of the head. Okay, so Gatikara seizes him by the hair and says, let's go see the Buddha. Now there's a great significance in that. Again, it's something very culturally conditioned, so those of you who have been born and grown up in America might not get it. But what is that significance? He grabs him by the hair. I don't know if you have these conventions in Sri Lanka as well. Okay, the idea is that now, generally, a low-class person shouldn't even touch an upper-class person. But to, for a low-class person to touch an upper-class person by the head or by the hair, it's like, you know, if they were to apply the rules of the Veda, he would be in danger of getting stoned to death or getting beaten, severely beaten. But Gatikara, you know, he wants to show that he's so insistent that Jyotipala should go see the Buddha that he's even willing to violate this very, uh, very dangerous class regulation in order to convince Jyotipala of his point. Probably he knows that Jyotipala is his friend, so Jyotipala won't do anything drastic to him. But if Gatikara were to touch another Brahmin, you know, who's not his friend on the head. He, if Gatikara were to touch another Brahmin on, his, on the head, he could be in for a severe beating. So that's why when Gatikara does this, 
Jyotipala thinks it's wonderful, it's marvelous. Here the words actually in Pali, Acharya, Buddha, they don't mean wonderful and marvelous the way we do when we are approving something as good. Like, you know, if somebody gives me a very delicious cup of tea and they ask, how do you like this tea? Oh, I say, oh, this is wonderful, this is marvelous. Not in that way, but it's more like in the sense like, this is amazing, this is astounding, this is really sh shocking. Well, maybe we could say this is really shocking that this Padagatikara, who was of an inferior cl class, really the word birth here, it's jati, but means class, should presume to grab me by the hair after we've washed our heads. So surely this must, this can't be something simple, that there must be some really important reason that he's doing this. So finally, Jyotipala agrees and says, okay, my dear Gatikara, you can let go of me. We'll go visit the Buddha. Okay, so they go visit the Buddha, um, Gatikara pays homage to the Buddha, because Gatikara is the disciple, and Jyotipala, who's still something of a proud Brahmin, exchanges greetings with him. You know, he can't be rude to the Buddha and say, you're just a baldy-headed recluse. So he has to say, conform to conventions and say, how are you, sir? Are you keeping good health? Do you like this monastery, this uh, this area here, and so on. So then after the, they exchange greetings, the Buddha gives a discourse to the two, two young men. And at the end of the discourse, what a surprise. Okay, they get up from their seats and then they depart. And then Jyotipala asks Gatikara, he says, now that you've heard the Dhamma, my dear Gatikara, why don't you go forth from the home life into homelessness and become a monk? And then Gatikara replies, he says, my friend Jyotipala, don't you know that I support my blind and aged parents? So apparently Gatikara is the only son, or at least the only son who's still living with the parents, who hasn't gotten married and moved away. And so it falls to Gatikara to support his old blind parents. And so now comes the big surprise that when Gatikara replies in this way, then Jyotipala, who is before so severely abrading and denigrating the Buddha, says, in that case, I'll go forth from the home life into homelessness. You know, so we can imagine that even though Jyotipala had been denigrating the Buddha, speaking ill of him, this was because, probably because, he had been born in the Brahmin class and this is replicating the situation in India at the time of the Buddha, where there was a kind of rivalry between the Brahmins and the Samanas. And the Brahmins, because they arrogated to themselves special privileges as being the ones who preserved the Vedas, the ones who performed the priestly ceremonies, the sacrifices, They thought that they were superior to the ascetics who would just put on, you know, ragged robes made out of rags and travel around without a home. And the Brahmins would get, would marry, usually marry and beget children. And so they would preserve, you know, the generations. They would preserve the human race from generation to generation. Whereas the Samanas observed celibacy. Okay, so as a young Brahmin, those, you say, the tendencies towards this condemning attitude towards the 
samanas would have been planted in his mind. But I would imagine that over many lives, you know, hundreds and thousands of lives, even many world cycles, the person who is now Jyotipala had been a follower of the Buddha, had made a vow under the Buddha to become a Buddha in the future. He had practiced paramis or paramitas. So he had you know, a vast treasury of wholesome accumulations deep in the, in the deep strata of his mind. But it's like something like a jewel mind, which is a jewel mine, which is covered over by a layer of soil, of dirt. So you just, if you just see the dirt, you think this is just useless land. You know, we could throw the refuse here. But if we dig a little bit and we just crack through that surf, that layer of dirt, then we come upon the rocks that are holding the jewels. And so Jyotipala's mind must have been like that. So there are the jewels of his uh, paramitas and his merits there, his meritorious deeds. But because he was born as a young Brahmin, he has always been conditioned by his, you know, his, maybe his parents, his elders, who were saying, you know, look at those ascetics, they're not working for a living, they don't know, they don't recite the Vedas, they don't marry and have children, they're just traveling around in rags, they're begging for their food, useless fellows. Okay, but now once he heard the Buddha speak, you know, the text doesn't give us any details, but when the Buddha gave the discourse, it sort of broke through, it was like a, like a spade breaking through that layer of soil, and it reached his, you know, it awakened a deep response in his heart, and so he made his determination to go forth and become a monk under the Buddha. Okay, so having made that decision, The two young friends go to the Buddha, and maybe Jyotipala is still a little shy, and so Gatikara is the one who speaks to the Buddha and says, this is again my friend, the Brahmin student Jyotipala, he wants to go forth and become a monk. And so then the Buddha gave Jyotipala the going forth, and he gave him the full admission or full ordination into the Sangha. Okay, so then after two weeks go by, two weeks after the ordination, the um, Buddha, together with his community of monks, <laughs> they leave Vebalinga and they travel to Benares, which somehow could ha conveniently happens to be there you know, <laughs> 20,000 years before the time, <laughs> at least 20,000 years but before the time of Gautama Buddha. And so they eventually arrive at Benares, and then they go to live in the deer park at Isipatana. Again, I'd say it's wonderful, it's marvelous that all of these places from the Buddha Gotama's time also are present in the time of the Buddha Kasapa. Okay, now at that time, the king of Kasi, Kasi is the state, the Indian state where Benares, of which Benares is the capital. Kasi would probably correspond largely to, at least to parts, or say to the central part of Uttarakuru. Not Uttarakuru. Uh, wow, this is terrible. I'm really getting old. There's Bihar. The state to the north and a little bit west of Bihar. It's the largest state in India where Delhi is located. Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't want to ask your age in public. <laughs> 
Okay, so the king Kiki hears that the Buddha Kasapa has come to the deer park at Asipatana and he goes to the Buddha, pays homage to him, um, exchanges greetings with him, hears a Dhamma discourse from him, and then paragraph 15, he invites the Buddha together with the community of monks to come to his palace the next day to take their meal. And so the Buddha Kasapa, following the tradition, accepts in silence. You know, probably he just doesn't stay silent, but he probably makes a little gesture like this. It's a way, this is a rather unique South Asian gesture of <laughs> saying yes. I think it's in India as well as Sri Lanka. Somebody, a writer, described it as if one were to delineate a figure eight with one's chin. You, you know it. <laughs> you know, in America, when we indicate yes, <laughs> we go like this. But at least this what I learned in Sri Lanka, and I think it's done in India, when people indicate yes, it's done something like <laughs> so when I first came to Sri Lanka, when I would be coming to my teacher for, you know, for lessons, I'd say, you know, the first few days, I'd say, Bhante, can I come to see you tomorrow afternoon for my Pali lesson? You go like this. <laughs> So I didn't come. <laughs> so then when he saw me, he said, why didn't you come? I said, didn't you indicate that I shouldn't come for the lesson? <laughs> so he said, what made you think that? I said, when I asked you whether I should come, you went. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, in our country, <laughs> that means yes. <laughs> so one has to learn <laughs> how things are indicated. So I think the Buddha probably, when the king invited him, would have gone like, like that. Okay, so then King Kiki you know, went back to the palace, and then he would have ordered his kitchen even the night before, late at night, to start preparing for the next day's meal. And then they prepare very high quality rice and with various sauces and curries. You know, these are different curry dishes. And then when the morning comes, he announces, informs the Buddha and the monks that the meal is ready. You can come to the palace. And so then the Buddha and all of the monks, they put on their full set of robes and they go to the palace and then they sit down at the seats that are offered. And then the king serves the Buddha and the monks with a meal. Then after, when the meal is finished, he sits down on a low seat next to the Buddha. And then he says to the Buddha, this starts the quite important passage. He says, Venerable Sir Bhante, let the Blessed One accept from me a residence for the rains here in Benares so I can do such service to the Sangha. Okay, now what is this residence for the rains? Now this is a custom established even in India before the time of the Buddha amongst the different ascetic communities in India and parts of Southeast Asia as well. The seasons are very fixed, and there's a particular season which begins usually about middle of July, and it lasts till about the middle of October. It varies from year to year, 
we would say sometimes early July till early October, late July to late October, when the monsoon rain arrives. And so every day there are heavy rains falling. And so it's very difficult to travel around. So in India it had become the custom going back to time immemorial for the different ascetic communities to settle down in one place for the three months of the rains during the rainy period. And they call that now the rains retreat or the rainy season residence. And it then becomes customary, at least this is done in the Buddhist tradition, sometimes people will ask one monk or a group of monks, rather than just having them live in their own regular monasteries, they'll invite them, they'll build a special residence for them. Or there'll be maybe a cottage, which is a bungalow, which is not being used, that they have. And they'll invite them, please come here and stay for the rainy season. We will provide you with all of your requisites. And then the monks will stay there for the rains retreat, three months of the rains retreat. And the supporters will provide them with you know, their food each day and any other requisites that they need. And so the Buddha, when the Buddha established the Sangha, then he instituted this practice for the Buddhists, for the Buddhist monastics as well. And so now the king has this in mind when he invites the Buddha to stay at Benares for the rainy season. But the Buddha politely rejects this invitation from the king. He says, enough king, I already have my residence for the rainy season. It's already been, I've already made a pledge to observe the rainy season someplace else. The king probably thinks, well, I'm the really powerful, I'm the ruler of the land. Maybe the Buddha just has to be asked a few more times. So he asked him a second time, a third time, please come and stay here for the rains. But a second time, a third time, the Buddha refuses. Okay, then the king, when he's refused three times, he becomes very disappointed and sad. Okay, so now the Buddha wants to cheer up the king. I think that might be his motive. I'm sorry. The king is the one who asked the question first. So he says, maybe with, he's asking this with the pride of a king. You know, since the, the king is thinking there can't be anybody more powerful, wealthier, more generous than I am. So he asked the Buddha, do you have a better superior than I am? You know, somebody who's superior to me? And the Buddha says, I do, great king. And then he says that there's this town called Vebalinga, and there dwells a potter named Gatikara. And he is my supporter, my chief supporter. When he says that, what is the king thinking? What? What might he be thinking? I don't think, though, that he's thinking so much in class terms, though it's on the right track. Not quite being made fun of, but That, say again. Yeah, yeah. He's like a bit shocked and astonished that he's like the most powerful guy in this part of India. And the Buddha says that his superior supporter, his chief supporter, you know, is just this Harry the plumber or... <laughs> you know, Tom the taxi driver.
you know, it's like, well, I don't especially like Jamie time, <laughs> but okay, I go into maybe, say I go to California, by chance I meet, what's his name, Bill Gates, okay. Bill Gates says, Bonte, we want to build a little cottage for you near the Microsoft office, where is it, Washington State? Or maybe I meet the chief executive of IBM, he says, <laughs> we want to build a little cottage for you to stay for the rains, um, you know, near our headquarters. And I say, thank you very much, but I have this, <laughs> you know, some quite ordinary supporters and near Zhuangyan Monastery and they'll look after me <laughs> during the rains. Maybe a guy who's a computer working in the computer, well, then Bill Gates might use his influence. Somebody who's working in tech industry and uh, was it New Jersey Technical University? <laughs> he says, what is that guy? I'm Bill Gates. I'm Jamie Dimon. Okay, but now the Buddha is going to explain Okay, so he says, you were very disappointed and sad, great king, but the Padagatikara, he never gets upset, he never gets disappointed. You know, he's, I guess his mind is always e equanimous. And now the Buddha is going to explain the virtues of the Padagatikara. The Gatikara has First, he's gone for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So apparently the king, we can infer, hasn't even gone for taking the refuges yet. But he's just, maybe the king is just has a generous temperament, and he likes to support ascetics, but he hasn't really specifically taken refuge in the Buddha yet. And then the Pada Gatikara, is one who observes the five precepts. He abstains from killing, from stealing, sexual misconduct, from false speech, and from using intoxicants. Okay, so what is being indicated at this point? Just take the uh, of taking the refuges and precepts together. Wait, wait, maybe take the, um, the microphone. Yeah, yeah. 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 And oh, the supporter of the Buddha, yeah. Yeah, the Buddha spoke about class social classes. Yeah, I don't want to go into this now because it would take us a little bit off track. But maybe to put it in a nutshell, the Buddha didn't try to like revolutionize or reform the Indian. First, the class system that existed in the Buddha's time, we wouldn't call it the same as the caste system that exists in India today. But society was divided into four social classes. The Brahmins, who were the priestly class, the kshatriyas, who were the administrators, the rulers, and the, the warriors, the uh, vaishyas, who were like the business class, and the landowners, 
and the sutras who were the working class. And then there were people outside the class system who performed like what was considered the low and menial type of work, the really low and menial type of work, like collecting garbage and refuse and uh, <laughs> sweeping up excrement and things like that and handling corpses. Okay, that, that class system later sort of became ossified in the form of the caste system with many subdivisions. So the Buddha didn't actually try to transform the class system, maybe because he saw that it was just so deeply established in India. But what he said is that one's sort of the true test but the true criteria for judging a person is not the class that he belongs to, but the person's moral qualities and wisdom. And within the monastic order himself, within the monastic order itself, he abolished the class distinctions. So everybody who becomes ordained gives up their class designation and becomes known just simply as a monastic. It used to use some. Uh, yeah. 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 I would say that that is what's being indicated by the Buddha's first statement when he says that my chief supporter is the potter Gatikara. But now, when the Buddha mentions the going for refuge and the five precepts, maybe I'll just say what this is. It's just, we say, that the basic observances of a good lay Buddhist. So the first step, going for refuge. Second step, taking the five precepts. But now something stronger is going to be indicated by what comes next. He has unwavering confidence, that's unshakable confidence, in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And he possesses the virtues loved by the noble ones. So something is being indicated here. One has to know a little bit the technical implications of unwavering confidence. Anybody know what that is? Well, that's being indicated by the next. Okay, let's take these two together. He has unwavering confidence in the Buddha and so on. And he is free from doubt about suffering, about the origin of suffering, about the cessation of suffering, and about the way leading to the cessation of suffering. What does that indicate? <coughs> okay, you're on the, on the right track. At least a stream enter. So it means that he's entered the stream of the Dhamma, and he's bound for liberation. So he's a noble one, an Aryan. But we'll see that he's not just the stream enterer. Okay, now come some additional virtuous qualities that don't really fall neatly into any category. But basically they show that Gatikara, even though he's living the home life, because he has to support his parents, but he's, you could say, he's in the home, he's living the life of a, of a monk without ordination. He eats only one meal a day. It's, and that would almost certainly be before the middle of the day. He observes celibacy, so he's celibate. And he's virtuous of good character. So eating only one meal a day or only, in, only one part of the day in the forenoon, observing celibacy, those are qualities of the monk. He has laid aside gems and gold, given up gold and silver. Again, that's like a monastic precept. And he does not dig the ground for clay with a pick or with his own hands. As a potter, he would use the clay to make the pots. But there's a monastic precept against digging the ground or cutting through the ground, probably to protect the living beings, the, the beings that live in the soil. So, Gatikara doesn't even dig the ground, but t 
to get the clay, he takes the soil that's broken off from river banks or is, that's thrown up by rats, and he uses that to make his pots. And then he doesn't accept, he doesn't sell the pots for money, but he lays out the pots, the jars and the pots, probably he has some shelves in front of his house, and he says, if anybody wants the pot, they can take the pots, but they should put down some foodstuffs as a kind of exchange. It's like a barter system. Some rice, beans, the lentils, and so on. And then like a good, devoted young, uh, young man, <clears throat> a very kind and helpful character, he supports his blind and aged parents. So all of these show how Gatikara is of good character. And then comes the sort of, maybe the giveaway to his status. The Buddha says, having destroyed the five lower fetters, he is one who will reappear or be reborn spontaneously in the pure abodes and attain final nirvana, final liberation there without ever coming back from that world. So from this we can know what is the status or level of Gatikara. Exactly, he's a non-returner. That's the, th the stream enter is like the first level of realization. Then the second level is the level of the once returner. And the third level is the level of non-returner. He's not yet fully liberated, but he's He's cut off the five lower fetters, that's the fetters that bind us to this world of sensual desire. And so he's taken rebirth in the pure abodes, and there he'll take, he'll achieve final liberation. Okay, now the Buddha tells uh, this, the, some stories about some of the behavior, or some of the aspects, some further aspects of the Potter Gatikara. Okay, so the Buddha here, <laughs> this gets a little confusing. Okay, this is the Buddha Kasapa. It's actually the Buddha Gotama telling the story placed in the, in the mouth of the Buddha Kasapa, Buddha Kasapa relating the virtues of Gatikara. So it's like a play within a play, a story within a story. So Buddha Kasapa is saying, one time when I was living at Vebalinka in the morning, I went with my bowl to Gatikara's house, and then the parents were there, so I asked them, where is the potter? And the parents replied that your supporter has gone out, but you can take some rice from the cauldron and some sauce. Or this would be like a probably lentils, you know, dal, curry dal or curry beans of some sort. You take it and eat. So the Buddha does so and leaves. Then later when Gatikara returns, somehow he must notice that the rice and the sauces have been taken. So he says, who has taken the, the food from, from the cauldron? And then the parents say, it was the Buddha Kasapa who did that. Then instead of Gatikara getting, you know, angry and upset and thinking, but there's nothing left for me to eat. He thinks it's a gain for me. I'm so fortunate. So, it's been such a great benefit for me that the Buddha Kasapa has so much trust in me that he'll just take the food that's left in the cauldron and in the saucepan. And so when he heard this, then Gatikara became filled with rapture and happiness, piti and sukha, for two weeks. And his parents were also happy for a full week. Yeah, because this is, they have the heart or the mind of generosity and the mind of deep devotion to the Buddha and the Dharma. And so when they hear this, then they become full of joy.
Okay, another time the same thing happens, except the food is the porridge rather than rice, and again they become filled with joy and happiness. Okay, the third time, the third incident, one time the Buddha, when he was, he apparently there was some grass thatching on his cottage and it was probably wearing thin. And so he sends the monks to the potter's house to find out if he has any extra grass, not like grass here, but more like hay to be used for thatching of the roof. And so he says, go find out if, if there's any grass or hay on the potter's house that can be used for, for, for my cottage. And the monks report that there's no grass over his house, at his house, but there's grass thatch over his workshop. And now the Buddha, this would seem a bit presumptuous, you know, for an ordinary person to do this. But the Buddha says, go monks. <laughs> I think I would get angry if I, <laughs> if I came back to Taishu Hall, <laughs> I saw a, a hole in my roof. <laughs> I ask Jin Li, who came and removed the tiles from the roof of Taishu Hall? <laughs> and she said, oh, Buddha Gota, Buddha Shakyamuni was here, and he, <laughs> and he sent the monks to take off the, the, the tiles from your roof. You know, even though I'm a monk, I was uh, <laughs> start grumbling and complaining. How can the Buddha do that? You know, what he wants to drive me away from Taishu Hall. It's, it's going to rain tonight. I'll get drenched with the rain. <laughs> Go back to the mon to his monastery. Tell him I want that those tiles back. <laughs> okay, but. The Buddha sends the monks to the potter's place and he says, remove the grass from the potter's workshop. Okay, so the monks do so and then while they're taking away the grass, the potter's parents, who are, they're blind so they don't know who's doing this, so they ask the monks, who's taking, who, who are you guys taking away the grass from the workshop? And the monks say that we are the monks, the disciples of the Buddha Kasapa, and his hut has been leaking and he needs some grass to repair it. And so we're, we want to use the grass for that purpose. And then the parents, you know, they're delighted and they say, take it away, dear ones. Okay, then when later when the Gatikara returns, he asks his parents, maybe well, he's a non-returner, so he doesn't get angry. So, but he's a little puzzled. So he says, "Who came around and took away the grass that was covering my workshop?" You know, now there's this, you know, there's an open space there. And then the parents say, "It was the Buddhist monks who did that, my dear. They were taking the grass in order to repair the hut of the Buddha Kasapa, which has been leaking." Then the Patagatikara again, he gets filled with joy and happiness. And also the parents, he gets filled with joy and happiness for two weeks. And the parents are filled with joy and happiness for a full week. And then a bit of a miracle takes place here that the workshop remained for three whole months. This must be a rainy season when it's raining. So, so for three whole months, it's raining, but, it, and there's no grass covering at least the part of the roof, but the rain doesn't come into the workshop. This is through the, probably through the, we call the Anubhava, the spiritual power or blessing power of the Buddha, or the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Okay, so now the Buddha Kasapa has finished relating the story about or praising the story, praising the virtues of his disciple Gatikara. And when the king hears this, then he becomes full of 
anumodana or mudita, altruistic joy, sympathetic joy for the Paragatikara. And he says, it's so, he's so lucky, he's so fortunate that you, the Buddha, rely on him in that way. Okay, now what comes next, the sequel, the last part of the sutta, is in, also this is interesting. <laughs> I have to bear it with equanimity. Don't you guys know I'm speaking about a sutta? I'm lecturing on the Dhamma? Okay, so then the king, he sends, you know, he, he knows that from the Buddha's story that the potter, you know, he's low, already low class, so he gets the idea the potter is pretty s poor, he has to make pots, and he doesn't even accept any money, but he'll just exchange the pots for gifts of rice and beans and lentils. So the king has 500 cartloads. We have to remember that 500 is usually an exaggerated figure. It just means you know, many, many cartloads of red rice stored in the sheaf. Apparently this is a kind of high quality rice. And also with, it's called sauce materials to go with it. This would be like lentils, beans, various vegetables, spices to make the, the dishes to go along with the rice. Probably some f fruits, things for making sweets, all sorts of food ingredients. Okay, so then the king's men, they come to the pata and they tell him what the king has sent to him. And then Gatekara replies, <laughs> the king is very busy and has a lot to do. I have enough. Let this be for the king himself. You can return this to the king. Okay, why does um, Gatekara reply in that way? What is this, the message being conveyed here? Do you have the, the microphone? Yeah, okay, that's a very good idea, or a good, a good suggestion, that Gatikara is content and you could say that, in a way, this is the Buddha giving a message through the example of Gatikara to others. The message would be, uh, be content. You know, don't be, you know, overly obsessed with gaining excessive luxuries and all the riches and luxuries. And maybe there's another subtle little message that's a subtle message that's coming through. I don't know if any of you have had close relations with kings. <laughs> but if you use your imagination a little. Okay, that's, yeah, uh, yeah. Be a little careful of, you know, getting too close to those in power. Of course, you know, they have, they could have their own agendas in the background. But yeah. Yeah. No, no, he's not sending them for the... Oh, I, I never thought of it in that way. No, I don't, I don't think that's the intention. 
Because if the mess, if they were sent with that intention, I think that message would have been given to the potter. These are for the Buddha and the monks. You keep them in your um, cottage. Then the potter would have accepted them on behalf of the king. But you see that Gatikara says, I have enough. So he's indicating that it's understood that the gift is for him. But I have to say also that there's another side to this. So I don't want people to misunderstand, to get the wrong impression. You know, maybe this is leaning a little bit to the extreme of contentedness. Maybe because the king is giving this gift. Maybe as Johnny suggested, maybe with some hidden agenda. So maybe that's why Gatikara is refusing. Of course, it's considered polite within the Buddhist monastic circle when some people offer something. It's considered always polite to accept at least some of it. You know, even if one doesn't need like 500 carts, but he could say, you know, what I would suggest to Gatikara, okay, you don't have to take all 500 carts, but put out, you know, a, a pot and let them fill one pot with uh, two pots, one pot with rice, one pot pot with beans. You could put out some dishes to take the spices and vegetables and other things. So accept some portion, but don't, you know, don't refuse everything. So within the monastic tradition, it's always considered, you know, the polite thing to sort of honor the generosity of others, even if one doesn't need something, to at least accept a little bit. Like you know, in the days when I was living in Sri Lanka, when we go on alms round, you know, sometimes there might be like seven houses we might go to. And sometimes by the time we get to the fourth house, you know, people have given rice and some, you know, other dishes to go with the rice. So seven houses within a hamlet, you know, a cluster of houses. So there's, and the bowl is, you know, we get enough already. The bowl is getting pretty full with four houses. But three other families, you know, or, or people are standing out with their bowl of rice and there's some other prepared vegetable. So, you know, we want to give them a chance also to make an offering. So, you know, we don't reject them and say, no, I have enough, and then turn around and walk away. But we go to the other houses, we just say, Tikak, tikak. It's just like in Chinese, idian dian, just a little bit. And so they'll put like one, like a soup spoon full of rice. Then we say, okay, not go eti eti, enough enough. <laughs> and then um, we take a spoon of the curry, like dal or some vegetable. Then go to each of the other two houses and accept just a little bit. You know, because even though it's more than we might need individually, but we give to you know, either some of the other monks or the men who are working in the temple. So that's this, it'll always get used. And if it's too much for them, I mean, too often we had to do this, but to give to the monkeys, because we had like three troops of monkeys around the hermitage. One would come right at lunchtime, <laughs> another would come about 12.30, another third group would come about one o'clock. Okay, so, okay, so just the final part of the sutta. Okay, now the Buddha Gautama has finished relating the whole story with, with that statement. And now we're, the, we're back to the Buddha Gotama speaking in the present time. So he says, now Ananda, you may think thus, certainly someone else was, oh, let me put it in better English, certainly the Brahmin student Jyotipala on that occasion was somewhat else, but it should not be regarded in that way. For I was the student, <laughs> the Brahmin student, Jyotipala, 
on that occasion. So here the Buddha, Gotama, or Shakyamuni, is identifying himself as Jyotipala. And this kind of trope, is that what you call this? A kind of a, a fixed kind of passage? This becomes very common in the Mahayana Sutras, particularly like in the Lotus Sutra, Sadharma Pundarika. Fawa. Yeah, Fawa Jing. Pericope, I think you call it, yeah. Um, pericope. Pericope is more like something like. A, yeah, or something like then. The venerable, then the Brahmin Chanusoni exchanged greetings with the Blessed One, and after they had finished their greetings, he sat down to one side and said to the Blessed One, I think that's a pericope. I'll have to look in the dictionary. But this kind of figure you get very often in Mahayana Sutras. I, I think what comes to mind is the Lotus Sutra, where you get the Buddha Shakyamuni is telling many, many stories about the past. You know, not just back to one earlier Buddha, but this is going back countless world systems, countless aeons. Then at the, lo at the end of this long, very elaborate story, he'll say, um, you may think that the king, fragrant, light, of the eternal sun, <laughs> some elaborate name like that, was someone else on that occasion, but you should not regard it in that way. On that occasion, I was the king, fragrant light of the eternal, <laughs> eternal sun. <laughs> okay, so this is the end of the sutra. Okay, so we could have some further discussion after the lunch, maybe we'll come back at say 12.15 or so. And next time we'll take the Ratapala Sutta. That's also a, a sutta which is given in the form of a story. Okay, so we'll end now with the sharing of the merits and then break for the lunch. Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakantu Sasanang Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakantu De sanang akasata chabumata deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu mang parang eta vatacha amhei sampadang punya sampadang sabe deva anumodantu sava sampati sedia the short way sabe but anumodantu Sava Sampati Siddhya Sabe Satanu Modantu Sava Sampati Siddhya Bhavagupadaya Avici Hitato E Tantare Satakayupapana Rupia Rupicha Sanya Sanino Tu Kapamuchantu Pusantu Nibuting.